Edwards of Purpose Built Communities. And I'm really here to facilitate the conversation. And, and, you know, I wish I could say that we planned it this way. To have this conversation on the heels of Dr. Tatum's conversation, I think, is really, really helpful. And I've already told these guys we're going off script to talk a little bit about what Dr. Tatum said. And hopefully, you guys will have some questions as we go through this. But uh, we were purposeful in our thinking about this session that we wanted to have a conversation both on the policy and on the practitioner side. Uh, one of the things, um, I, I would say the first question we get asked when we go out and talk about our model to new communities who have never heard of us, is, is, is all around the mixed income housing question. We were in both focus. And it's, in fact, even though it, that, that term might be quite familiar to, to folks in this room, it's been in lots of places in the country that people have not thought about it or heard about it. Or, in fact, if you look at the way that the development community is divided in this country, it's mostly you've got market rate developers on one side, you've got affordable housing developers on the other, and very few folks who really, uh, let alone specialize in mixed income, but even provide any mixed income housing in this country. So um, we spent a lot of time explaining what it is we mean by mixed income, why it's part of our model, and, and to do that, and, and before you even get into the the complexity of actually delivering mixed income housing, we spend a great deal of time talking about the history. And that's where you know, uh, Dr. Tatum touched on this a little bit. And if you haven't read um, The Color of Law that just came out this year by Richard Rothstein, mm. he's a Cal Berkeley professor, um, he has done a huge service in documenting the specific federal, state, local laws, the private actions by banks and um, and real estate companies that have, have, have um, engineered, really, the, the neighborhoods that we're talking about today, these segregated neighborhoods with concentrated poverty. It's just layers and layers of policies and private actions that have created these circumstances. And, and if you don't understand that history and really apply it to the neighborhoods within, within which you're working, it's very hard to really develop really effective solutions to that. And, and so we spend quite a bit of time talking about that with, with uh, our local partners to get them to really set the stage for why we think mixed income housing is so important. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start just by setting a couple of definitional um, points. When we call, talk about mixed income housing, um, the, the, first of all, there's two dimensions in which you need to think about it. One is at the, at the little the development level. And uh, we'll talk about, in fact, you just saw, if you went on the tour yesterday, you saw a mixed income development. And there, I think we'll get into what that means in terms of how to develop that, the complications in financing it, the complications in managing those properties. But there's also mixed income at the neighborhood level. And so in thinking about this work, we encourage folks to be envisioning and aspiring to creating mixed income neighborhoods and that mixed income developments are a tool in the toolbox to get you there, but it's not the only um, thing you need to worry about, the, not the only set of um, efforts you need to engage in, but really because the, at the end of the day, you wanna have healthy, integrated mixed income neighborhoods, and that takes a set of tools beyond just building a, a multifamily mixed income project. Um, and then the, the second thing I wanted to mention was, um, the, 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 and we'll talk about this with, with, with these guys, but the, the, the outcomes that we worry about, whether it be health outcomes, whether it be public safety outcomes, educational outcomes, um, we would make the case that those outcomes are delivered through healthy neighborhoods which have a mix of incomes in them. And in fact, what we're trying to do is create the conditions out of which those outcomes will emerge independently. All of us live in cities, or most of us live in cities, that have healthy neighborhoods. And we know what they look like. You spend three minutes at a healthy neighborhood and you, you, you can recognize it as a healthy neighborhood. Um, those, most of those healthy neighborhoods have not been, are not healthy because there are a bunch of folks doing a lot of work like we're doing. They're healthy because they're self-sustainable, healthy neighborhoods. And so the real ambition, I think, for all of the work that we're doing is to create self-sustainable, healthy neighborhoods and keeping uh, mixed income housing available in those neighborhoods is a key component of sustainability, particularly in the long run when you want to maintain a wide channel of opportunity for low-income people to live in, in healthy communities. 
So with that, let me introduce you to my, to my uh, esteemed panel here. Um, Salin Jivajiz is a um, um, former uh, federal official who worked at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. That's where I met him. He was a senior advisor there. And as, you as you may remember, uh, the Obama administration was really the first administration to really think about place base in their work. And Salin was a key uh, engine behind that thinking. And, and um, they, the, the, we're, we're so thrilled to have him here because he can, I think, give some perspective on the policy drivers, both at the federal level and at other levels, around um, uh, about how the government now is thinking about delivering its resources and its policies to support place-based place change. Um, he is now at the uh, Center for Social Policy in Washington. And as he, as he explained earlier to me, that's freed him up now from the <laughs> burdens of being part of an, uh, uh, the federal government. So I'm hoping he'll be quite um, blunt in his thinking about what the federal government is doing now, what it should be doing, but also sort of general policy around how to support mixed income development. Rich Shortino is, as you may have met, as you've heard, as uh, he's introduced this morning, is the um, uh, co-founder of Brinshore Development, and Brinshore is the partner in the development that you saw in Omaha yesterday. And uh, as I've got this story right, I'm not sure, Rich, but um, Rich found us. Rich was um, a housing, is a housing developer in Chicago, uh, was frustrated with working with the Ch Chicago Housing Authority um, because of the, the way that the developments were done that were sort of housing focused and not thinking about neighborhood revitalization. As I understand the story, you did some Google searches looking for holistic neighborhood revitalization and came across purpose-built communities, and that's how we, I think we got connected. So we're thrilled to have Rich here and as a partner and really as a resource um, as we hopefully partner more and more with communities around the country looking to do these kinds of mixed income projects. So Salon, let me start with you. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the sort of your experience with the federal government and, and how, the, where you think we are in, as, a, as a country in moving towards this notion of mixed income communities and, and what the federal government, at least in your experience, what progress has been made and how far along do you think we've, we've proceeded down that path? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's a lively crowd. <laughs> Caffeinated, I honest. hope. Um, I was joking with the gentleman before that it is, uh, hopefully with no offense taken, but if so, whatever, that, uh, that it is great to be able to say, I don't bring you greetings on behalf of the President of the United States. Uh, I don't. I do speak on my own behalf now. And so part of actually the, the opportunity and challenge of responding to David's question is, uh, is speaking to what the experience was during the Obama administration, both throughout, as David mentioned. Uh, I came into the administration fairly early on in late 2009, when many of the place-based initiatives across many of the agencies were getting thought of. This was when Promise Neighborhoods, Choice Neighborhoods, uh, the Sustainable Communities Initiative, Strong Cities, Strong Communities, there was a whole suite of approaches uh, that was being taken. And I would say a couple of things. Uh, I, as it relates to mixed income communities now and, and the state of affairs. And some of which, and you mentioned it before, David, uh, actually Dr. Tatum set us up really nicely. Uh, I think you probably all feel it acutely that uh, you are running up against a resegregation trend. You know, so to say that we are going with a tide versus against a tide in so many of our places, I think Dr. Tatum made it clear, it is you are, you are facing strong headwinds of imagination, of aspiration, of what is possible in these places. I think we knew that as a matter of policy. When Secretary Donovan actually took over in the early part of the administration, um, there were a number of things we would often say, and he would often say, which is part of what we have to do is to embrace that history that Dr. Tatum talked about in the role of the federal government in creating the situation that we are in, and that as a matter of policy, we would try to be about the undoing of many of those, uh, many of those policies and the kind of regulatory apparatus. 
Uh, it is a, a challenge now in the current uh, administration about what the tack will be toward those same policies, but here's some hopeful signs. In the last couple of years, so I served, I didn't think I was going to, but I served seven of the eight years. I looked up once and I said, oh my gosh, we're, we're done, uh, and we're about to be out of here. And the fortunate circumstance, which I think hopefully bodes well for your work, not only those of you who work with, uh, with HUD, but also many of the other agencies, is that uh, the conditions I think were set among many of the career staff about a new normal of working across the agencies. And for the better part of the last two, two plus years of the administration, there were more and more agencies who began, quite frankly, to get more fluent and competent around how does housing relate to transportation, relate to schools, relate to jobs. And so that uh, basic capacity building, I think, among the staff uh, uh, was done. The challenge is right now, and I, and I would say it would be a very easy instinct for all of you to essentially write off the federal government, to write off all those federal partners and say, we're gonna kinda do it by ourselves, do it alone, go state, local, which I think is part of the equation. Uh, what I would say to you is you have a lot of folks who I worked with at HUD who are your partners and who may in this administration feel increasingly isolated, uh, but they're not isolated in terms of their shared mission with you. And I think we should think through what that looks like practically for folks at both at the federal level and in the regional level for us to kind of work together. But I, I think the, the, at least the fundamental reality that we face is you're, we're swimming upstream. We have to make the case for mixed income in a much more strong and provocative and resonant type of way. But if there is one thing that I think we'll get into that actually we are probably swimming more with the tide is, it seems like silo busting as a frame is much more accepted now. People get the sense, and I saw Miss here nodding ahead in affirmation, I think an amen was coming from that side, where she was like, that's great, housing related to schools, related to transportation, related to jobs. So I think there are more and more people who actually embrace that we have to think about all these tools together. So I think what I'm hearing Solon say is that we, we have friends in the deep state. You have friends in the deep state. <laughs> All right. So that you does do. Not, that's not right off the federal government. You okay. can, yes. Um, Rich, talk a little bit about, so from the ground up, so you're, you're spending your time putting deals together and you're, you're piecing together financing tools to make this work happen. Talk a little bit about how you see the environment right now, how it's changed in the last few years and where you think it's headed. Uh, I, think, I think that there's a big distinction to be made between traditional affordable housing, which I describe as sort of low-income housing tax credit infill projects, which by and large are all mixed income on a very small scale. They, they may be 80% uh, affordable and 20% market rate, but they're at least attempt to be mixed income. And then the much harder work is where we mostly, uh, the, the work we do here is, is around public housing redevelopment, which is large former public housing sites, which despite the fact that it wasn't with the housing authority, the purpose-built site here in Omaha was a former public housing site. So there's large tracts of land, generally with people who are former public, public housing residents, which have, who have the most needs. Um, and, and um, you know, so our experience has, has been around that. Primarily, that, that's where the difficulty comes in, is, is how do you blend people at the lowest mm. uh, income levels with people who are, you are trying to bring in who are at much higher income levels. And it's when, when the income levels are mm. condensed into a much smaller range, the job of, of integrating mixed income is much easier. It's when you have these very broad income classes that it gets much more difficulty, uh, much more difficult. So, you know, where, where we see it uh, at this point, you know, that the big projects that, that we've been involved with, the HOPE 6 projects, which are primarily the ones that we've done in Chicago, um, 
that program has, uh, 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 has ended and the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative has taken its place, but it is a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. I think five awards last year, we're doing one in Kansas City, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's really a drop in the bucket. So the, you know, this purpose-built model where we're creating that, that, that intention out of whole cloth is all that's left, frankly. And, and so the idea of, of using that framework, the purpose-built framework, is it is absolutely, after 25 years of doing that, it, it is absolutely the right ingredients. This, this idea that education is leading this, this effort and is break, breaking the cycle of poverty is, you know, we, we've done over 2,000 units of, of mixed income housing that are on, public housing land, so you know, these difficult ones. And I can tell you that that is where we are focused. It is, mm. it is immensely difficult to figure out how to change people's lives once they are a parent, once they have, a, you know, they're in that stage of life that they're beyond a, you know, the education stage. But we're hopeful that, that this mixed income environment is breaking the chain for this next generation, that, that, that for the kids who are growing up that are experiencing this mixed income environment, that, that, those, that those kids are going to grow up to be different parents. And, and we're hopeful that, that we can change the dynamic going forward. But overall, um, you know, these large scale mixed income redevelopments are, um, they're starting to slow down. And so we're trying to figure out ways, like here in Omaha, where we have replaced the federal government with philanthropic uh, sources, whether that's a model that can be replicated. I mean, th what happened in Omaha has never happened anywhere. I mean, it is just a an amazing testament to the philanthropic community in this, in this city. But, uh, you know, as, as I like to say, our community, our, our, our quarterback in Omaha is, is like Tom Brady. You know, the, the, they are, they're, you, you can't lose with, with, with the support that they have here. That doesn't exist in a lot mm. of places. And, and we've traveled around the country and been to a lot of the places that are purpose-built communities. And there are completely different environments and a much, um, in my opinion, much more difficult process to really affect mixed income housing in those places that it's really hard to do. So, so let me ask you a follow up on that because uh, just to put a finer point on it, because one of the things that we encounter is um, there's really two barriers locally um, and, and just talking about sort of the public housing opportunities to, to redevelop public housing properties. One, one is, and the first one we encounter is whether the public housing authority even wants to be in this business of thinking about neighborhood revitalization. You know, there, there are several public housing authorities, some of whom uh, are represented with, even within our network who we've tried to work with, um, who simply did not see themselves as being uh, in the neighborhood revitalization business. They had properties, they had, their job was to make sure those properties were being run well, that they complied with HUD regulations, um, but that they weren't looking to be a partner in a larger redevelopment. So the first question is, and the, the, what, to what degree is that a barrier to increasing the pipeline of this kind of work? And then the second part of that question is, if, and depending on what the answer to the first one is, how much then is also simply the financing availability? You've touched on philanthropy. I can assure you that most of the folks that we work will, will not be able to generate the kind of philanthropy mm -hmm. that was needed here in Omaha. Um, in fact, I would say the major, vast majority of our projects in our housing piece did not bring really much of any philanthropy to the table. So how much of it is a financing issue if you get past that first sort of policy hurdle? Um, you know, the answer to your first part of the question with public housing authorities, uh, you know, they run the gamut from competent to, well, I, I won't, I'll, be, I'll be kind and say, you know, not incompetent, but competent, um, to, so competent. <laughs> to engaged, which are, there are plenty of housing authorities that are perfectly capable of doing their own development, I, I, and, and, but I think of most of those are not thinking about this in the same holistic level. They're, they're more thinking about their portfolio and, and how to position it. Um, and then there are some that are enlightened, I'd say, and, and they're slightly more engaged, but they are not approaching this. They're approaching it much more as a bureaucratic protectionist 
you know, how, how do we maintain ourselves and still fulfill our mission of providing affordable housing, but they're not thinking about how to change lives. Um, and so, so the housing authorities, again, you, you run the gamut. And, and the best ones for us are the ones that give us free reign. You know, they say, okay, we like what you've done. Tell us how you're doing it. We build a relationship and trust, and then we sort of run with it. Um, you know, the financing part of it is, is, is the difficult part. Affordable housing isn't about real estate. Mm. <laughs> as much as we, as much as, it, it, we, you know, we see it, we feel it, we touch it, we know it is real estate, I, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating that, but it's the, the, the effect of this, of, uh, how to affect the transaction is not about typical supply and demand. It is about financing. It is about how do you find the sources to make a transaction happen. And those sources are getting more and more difficult to find. Um, and so, you know, we're, people are beginning to think creatively about how to incorporate more market rate into a development so that you can support some affordable, um, uh, you know, just, just ways to do that. The public housing uh, uh, resources are really a wash. You know, they, they kind of pay for the public housing replacement. Uh, you know, so I, I, like, I like to think of the public housing dollars that come in really pay for the public housing component of the redevelopment. They don't really support anything beyond that. So trying to find a way to finance the rest of it is what's, what's difficult. And once you insert public housing into the mix, um, as much as I'd like to think that it isn't true, it is, it is, it taints the project. You know, it, it, people who, who live there, you've got to be really careful about how you mix market rate in with public housing because whether you like it or not, people will stereotype your development as having public housing in it. As people like to say, is that Section 8 housing? That's the question I always get asked. Mm. Is that Section 8 housing? And, and I say, first of all, that's, that's not a good term. Let's call it workforce housing or affordable housing, however you want to term it, but it's not Section 8 housing. So, so I'd say that the financing is getting more and, and more difficult and, it, and it, um, you know, it's, it's, it's causing developers to think more creatively about how to finance this outside of the traditional realm of, of, of affordable housing finance. So in the absence of philanthropy, I mean, the big, biggest challenge, and Othello touched on it yesterday, was how to get deep subsidy into these developments in the absence of, of a public housing partner. Um, and so understood the, the challenge of the sort of the mix across all the incomes. But at the end of the day, if, we, if we're really aspiring to making sure that these communities have, um, have a wide channel of opportunity for very low income people to live, which is the only real way we're gonna break the cycle of intergenerational poverty, figuring out how to make sure that those, do those dollars, those public housing partners are effective partners, um, ultimately I think is the, is the only path forward. Otherwise you're looking at a deep philanthropic investment in, in, in subsidies for, for housing. The other, the other thing that, uh, Rich, um, we can talk about this in a second, but you, the, this diversity across the communities that we work in, um, part of what in the economics of the mixed income housing is, you know, what can you really expect to charge on the market side of your housing developments? So when the, the housing you saw yesterday, I think the, the high number on a one bedroom apartment there is something like $770. That is a tough market rate number to meet in terms of the cost of building that housing, I'd assume. Whereas in other places, you can, uh, in neighborhoods that have sort of pent up demand of, of, and have some assets that will bring in market rate renters when you can charge $1,100, $1,200 a unit, and I'm sure that changes the dynamic considerably. San, talk a little bit about, so your work at the Center for so Social Policy, I mean, are you, are you, talk about the research that people can use to make this case for mixed income housing. What, what is it that we should be pointing to to say that the introduction of this kind of housing in these kinds of neighborhoods will generate the kind of benefits we're, we're talking about? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm going to do two things. Uh, I'm going to respond real quickly to something that Rich really put on the table, and, and, and perhaps with a collective admonition for all of us on the, uh, in this room. Uh, I don't think that we can let, Rich wasn't suggesting this, I don't think we can let policymakers off the hook. Uh, I think for us to proceed into this space, 
thinking as though either the charitable or the philanthropic sector is going to make the math. You weren't suggesting it, Rich. But I think, uh, again, it would be very easy for us to say that uh, those resources from the public sector uh, uh, are not flowing, they shouldn't flow, they should flow. They should flow. And to your point about reaching uh, deep within our communities for those public housing residents or those others, I, I'm curious, how many folks are working with public housing residents here in the audience? Okay. So, you know, it is, it is deeply, uh, it's a deeply challenging space, but it is the nature of the work that we have to do. And so I just wanted to put that out there. It would be, it would be very easy for all of us to take years off from policy influence. Just say, right? It's just too hard. It's too, please, I'm telling you as a, as a recovering policymaker, don't take, <laughs> don't take time off from harassing those of us who worked on policy, right? Uh, you have to press forward on demand, so that's first thing. Second, to answer the question. Um, uh, in the work that we're doing right now, in the, in, uh, part of what we're doing is putting together a, a, a small kind of learning network that is very focused on what I call the unfinished business of, of mixed income communities. A lot of the things that have worked well, but a lot of the things that are still a part of the unfinished business. Many of the stories that we know that have worked well and that many of you can really attest to are uh, how the physical transformation of these communities has, is night and day in these places. And I never want to underestimate how important actually having a physical transformation in a neighborhood is. Where the mixture of results happens is on the pe people side, right? The extent to which, to Rich's point, there is level of cohesion and community building across those income groups. That is very mixed. It is very mixed across the country, right? It needs a level of intentionality in it for, to Beverly Tatum's comments around how is it uh, that healing and transformation and people across these uh, neighborhoods and in a neighborhood and in a project can actually work together. That's, that, is pretty, that is pretty mixed. Um, we are working, you all are working in places where the market pressures uh, are very different. How many high cost market places are in the audience where it's very unaffordable to live, right? You know, we are, right now the research will tell us, we are in an affordable rental crisis in the country, period. In 30 of our major metropolitan areas, uh, at least the Joint Center would say, is we are probably 50,000 plus units behind in terms of the relationship of supply and demand. Uh, we are building much more high-end rental now. So when we get to the options that may be available for market rate, when you were talking about Omaha, there are choices for those people. Are, are they going to choose to live in a mixed income community when they may have other choices? That's part of the reality that we actually have to, have to play to and it's playing out around the country. So there is an affordable rental cri crisis in the country. And I would say in work that we're seeing, and where there is the level of kind of policy influence that are necessary, we've got to see more kind of carrots and sticks used. Um, more look at what incentives will actually create both local, state, and even at the federal level to create better conditions for this work on the ground, for financing to actually flow in a much more powerful way. Um, and I hate to say it, you know, you, you heard Dr. Tatum talk about the role of policy in creating the conditions we are in. Uh, there is a role for sticks. If we leave markets unbridled in certain kinds of ways without a way of steering them, we have challenges for our, the people we uh, care the most about, how we protect them, how we put policies in place that enable them to actually secure the affordable housing over the long term. I think those are all things that we actually have to think about. So let me follow up on that because I, I, there's a couple, couple of key things you said in there. Um, certainly when we have these conversations, uh, and I don't know how much of this dialogue is impacted simply by kind of general national feelings about gentrification and what's happening in our cities versus what's really happening specifically in the neighborhoods that we're working in. So I'll give you an example. 
you've heard uh, Grove Park as a, a new, our new ne newest network member in our second project in Atlanta, which is on the west side of Atlanta. And it's a, we're in the middle of a mayoral election, and the first issue that comes up in every debate is affordability, is gentrification. Um, but when you look at, for example, in this neighborhood that we're, work that we're working with, this team in, in Grove Park, you see very little evidence of gentrification happening there. You look at the property values, you look at the vacancy rates there, there's, you could make the case that 100% of the housing in Grove Park is today affordable. And so the lack of affordable housing in that particular micro part of Atlanta is not, is arguably not the issue. Now, 10 years from now, it very well could be the issue. Um, and one of the things that we've been thinking about, and I'd be curious as to your perspective on this, Salen, is one of the things that if, we are, if our Grove Park team is wildly successful in doing what they're doing, building a new school, building a YMCA, building an early learning center, that dynamic of that neighborhood will change. Those, the, the value of that property will go up significantly. But the, that value will accrue to the absentee landlords, mm. the slumlords that are there now. They'll be in a position to cash in on that value that's created as a consequence of what, what is largely a philanthropic and public sector set of investments. So when, you, and so when thinking about long term, if the goal is to secure affordability in these neighborhoods, after we've been successful. How, how can we, I mean, is there a role for government or is there a role for uh, the, the philanthropic center or is there a role for the private sector to, to, to create a mechanism by which some of that residential equity value that's going to be created in these neighborhoods is captured? I, just to give you a shorthand, we did the analysis on Eastlake, you know, Eastlake's 20 years in. We estimate that uh, over a billion dollars worth of uh, residential equity has been created in that neighborhood since we start, since the work was started there. We have no real way of knowing where that ended up. Like whose pocket did that end up, that it, did it end up in? Our suspicion is that it was a lot of folks who, who invested, speculated in the real estate in that neighborhood. Um, Tom Cousins will, will say his biggest mistake in Eastlake is they didn't buy as much land as he should have. Because when he was there originally, he could have bought, that land was very cheap, could have bought a lot more. Um, is that the right, is that the path forward? Is it to buy land? Is it the, should the government be buying land in anticipation of this problem that we're hoping, hoping to create? I mean, I'd be curious how Rich, and so uh, hopefully Rich will go after me and he can actually say everything the Salon says makes no sense. So um, a, couple of, a couple of ways to answer that question, David. One is uh, both in the various roles that I've had, including the one that I was just in, in the administration where folks uh, may end up coming in to say uh, affordability is not our issue now. Uh, but they want to take steps because they know at any given moment, whatever the cycle might be, two, three, five years, given sets of investments that happen in places including on the west side of Atlanta, where in very short order that market and those market forces start taking over um, and, uh, and you have a lost opportunity, right? And so the timeliness of working in advance, both on the policy tools and the kind of programmatic interventions that need to happen, I think can't be underestimated. But because I've, I've seen these conversations and all of us have seen these conversations where steps weren't taken quick enough and then the opportunity is lost, and it's very hard to get in on a market sometimes to preserve affordability when the costs are so high, right? And so our collective attentiveness to the timeliness of having a conversation at the policy level, I think there's probably an all hands on deck uh, strategy that's necessary, both from the public, the private, and the philanthropic side. I was having a conversation recently where, and you know, the truth of the matter is our ecosystems and our places are different. We have places where, uh, where uh, government and public sector capacity is weak, and often it takes uh, other actors to step in, in some kind of collaborative uh, arrangement. Uh, and so we have an ecosystem where sometimes our affordable housing sector, again, is very weak. And how do we actually make the right kind of capacity building investments so that uh, folks on the affordable housing side can take the right steps in time 
that are really necessary. You know, there are more and more tools that we're seeing, value capture arrangements, other kinds of more technical policy tools that are taken to recapture value and make sure that it is uh, protected over the long term and designated over the long term. I think we're seeing, and I, I heard just most recently, even in Atlanta, steps that are being taken to preserve you know, uh, property taxes at certain levels. Different tools that are, a, are there to protect uh, affordability, to protect asset creation over the long term. So again, I think it's all hands on deck and it's probably still unsettled which are going to be the more powerful tools over time, but, uh, but that would be my quick response. Yeah, I, I say you know, gentrification is um, in, in places, in cities like Atlanta, which are growing, um, gentrification is a concern. In Midwestern cities where population is shrinking, Gentrification is a, in, in, in a lot of cases, is a, is a mistaken uh, term. Uh, it's, it's really about revitalization. I mean, you, you have to run the risk that you, by revitalizing a neighborhood, that you potentially could run into a situation where you're gentrifying a neighborhood. But you have to run that risk. I mean, we're all here about creating healthy neighborhoods. And, and in order to do that, you have to revitalize it. And if you, if you, if you happen to, past the tipping point where revitalization turns into gentrification and it takes on a life of its own and it runs away from you, well, then you move on to the next neighborhood. I know that's a, 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 a little Machiavellian, but, but um, you know, and, 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 and I don't, and, and, that, and the, the fact of the matter is, is that I've been working in Chicago for 30 years and I've been working in Milwaukee and in Indianapolis and in these Midwestern cities that it, it, is, it isn't happening. It, it, you know, it, it is the fear of gentrification that is leading to people um, being less bold than they should be. Um, so I would encourage that, um, that uh, you, you know, you do things. Let me give you an example. So we're working in a neighborhood in South Chicago with an artist named Theaster Gates. Um, he's an incredible artist who has made his reputation based on Placemaking and uh, around art that 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 it's a black African American community that black people should have beautiful things and cultural events to go to just like white people should on the north side. That's the Astor speaking. Um, so we've done a, a couple of projects with him. One was a former public housing site. We we converted half the units to artist housing and half to were public housing, and we built a beautiful new art center in the middle, and that becomes the engagement place. Um, he's done a number of installations around a bank. He's converted an old bank building into a, into a, a, a basically a museum and a number of other initiatives. And now we're thinking about, you know, how do we change this neighborhood? It still hasn't had a real effect on the neighborhood. You know, it's, had, it's gotten him world, you know, international acclaim around this idea of placemaking in an inner city neighborhood, but it hasn't changed the neighborhood at all. And so my conversations with him are, right, well, how do we really change the neighborhood? I mean, how, how do we get people into a better place? And, you know, the first thing that happens when you have this in a forum, you know, we did. We had one in a forum at his bank. And the first thing that happens is someone says, you know, you're going to run out all the poor people that are here now. They're all going to leave. And then what, what happens then? And the answer is, you've got to run that risk. And you've got, to, you've got to at least take the steps of trying to change the neighborhood. And if it so happens that, that it changes too much, you know, I suppose that you, you, you know, is that a success or a failure? But the things that you can put in place immediately are, you know, build some high quality affordable housing. Don't do any harm. Don't do damage. Don't build poor quality affordable housing so that you create a stigma of a neighborhood that you can never overcome. So build good quality affordable housing. And secondly, promote home ownership. So if the people who are going to benefit, if the neighborhood does change and it tips beyond revitalization of the gentrification, at least the people who would have benefited are people who lived there originally, their equity increased, and maybe they moved on, but at least someone benefited from it. I, I'm glad you raised the home ownership issue because it's something that's certainly on folks' mind because much of what we talk about in mixed income housing and certainly the developments that, that are engaged in our projects, it's, it, much of it is multifamily rental mm -hmm. housing. Um, one of the statistics, if those of you who were at our conference two years ago, David Williams gave a presentation, he's the sociologist from Harvard, about the um, 
he gave some, some great statistics, one that I've been using uh, and abusing uh, in the last two years is he pointed out that in, on income, the average uh, African-American family earns 59 cents for every dollar that the average white family earns in this country. But the key statistic was that for every dollar of wealth that white families have in this country, African-Americans have six cents. So even though that income issue is one we is really gets a lot of focus on and is important, it's that wealth gap that is the real catastrophe, right? Because if you're thinking about intergenerational poverty, when you have that little, of, and the, actually the numbers are something like $134,000 to $11,000 in, in family wealth. With that little amount of wealth, every family in that, in that range is on Tinder hooks, right? Any, any medical emergency, any loss of employment, and they're back into poverty. And how do you close that gap? And the fact is in this country, 70% of wealth is, uh, is residential equity. And so if you look at, and I would encourage you to go look at what's happened in, in property values in your cities since the crash in predominantly African-American neighborhoods and predominantly white neighborhoods. And if it, if it um, adheres to the national average, what you'll see is that white neighborhoods lost a lot of value but have now recovered and have, have actually now exceeding where they were in say 2008. And not, it's not the same in predominantly African American neighborhoods that have not recovered that value. The, um, if you look at Grove Park, which I mentioned earlier, they haven't recovered the value that they were in 1997. It's the start of the run-up in the, in the housing market. They're still below that level. So that gap in, um, in wealth and how to close that gap through residential equity um, is, is incre increasingly on top of our agenda and thinking about how do you get uh, low-income families into home ownership positions to take advantage of what we hope to be a gentrifying and improving neighborhood. Have, uh, San, have you had any, had any thoughts and, and uh, has any I research mean, I, on that? I, 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 what you just outlined, David, I would consider the unfinished business of mixed income. I mean, I think it is the kind of conversation that needs to be had. And I, and I would also say, uh, we had a, a, a conversation uh, even about the session beforehand, our being uh, particularly poignant about the uh, racial equity and inclusion dynamics of mixed income, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, we, in fact, if you heard Dr. Tatum's language when she said mixed income presumably cross race, right? Uh, because I think our mental frame is that if we go mixed income, it's going to be mixed race, it not always is. And how things play out, uh, uh, within a development, but I think, David, to your point, we have to get at income, we have to get at wealth, and whether that is how these projects and the set of innovations that take place in terms of who owns, what does ownership look like in these places, um, who owns the land. We do have tools that are available, whether they actually get deployed in the mixed income space that enable land to be held in a certain way. Those are very complicated models, community land trust models uh, that are actually out there. Uh, the scaling of those gets a little bit more problematic as you start taking a look at it. But you have, you have a network, David, purpose-built network where you guys could innovate on these, on these questions that adds additional layers of complexity to you. But if you are about confronting intergenerational poverty, and I think all of us are in that business, I think you've got to confront that, that statistic that, you are, that you're after. Any thoughts, Rich, on the home ownership side of this? Yeah, home ownership is, um, in, in these neighborhoods, is tough. I mean, in Chicago, for example, uh, your statistic is telling, but in Chicago, it's the same way. I mean, places that, that you know, appreciated up to $180,000 dropped down to $60,000, $40,000. It's crazy in Chicago where prices are so much higher than that in most places. And, um, and they haven't come back at all. There's a, I mean, there are just, it, Chicago is one of those places where it's a tale of two cities. I mean, it, mm. it, there are parts of the city that surround downtown where it's, um, you know, it's come back and more. But the rest of the, the, the fringe areas have languished, frankly. So, you know, the, if there is an intention, if, 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 if you are in a purpose-built community, home ownership should be a part of, of the equation. In Omaha, for example, the neighborhood where we're, we're working in, 
to build new construction, let's just say that it costs one hundred sixty or one hundred eighty thousand dollars to build a new house. Um, the property values there don't support that. They're they're not even close to that. Uh, so so how do you you know how do you bridge that gap? Um, and in, in, in the model that we've used really successfully is, I don't know if I'm sure some of you remember uh, in 2007, 2008, there was the uh, Neighborhood Stabilization Program and there was this NSP program and we rehabbed 100 houses in Evanston, Illinois. And for those of you who don't know where that is, it's just north of the city of Chicago. It's a racially integrated community. And we rehabbed 100 houses, um, half of which were for home ownership that we resold at a discount to people to stabilize pricing, you know, so that the so that the market would would readjust to these higher prices, uh, and secondly, to uh, to promote long-term affordability. Um, but it, 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 it's it's that's that is hard to, to do. Um, it's it's hard work. It's hard to do the construction aspect of it efficiently. It's it's hard to acquire the properties. It is the hardest part of of this whole housing spectrum is doing the single family home ownership piece is, is really difficult. And it's, I, I commend, I heard Birmingham did 83. 83. Yeah. You know, and that's not a bad way to go to, to start with doing um, home improvement uh, aspects to, to, to visually show an impact um, in the neighborhood that things have changed. You know, that from the exterior that these houses are looking better and you know and the story begins to reinforce itself that you know hey things are happening in this neighborhood and you can see it well thanks for that and i want to open up for questions the last this one thing i'd say about that i get that. the sense we're bumming out this audience are we bumming out this that's not a positive message um, <laughs> one of the things so uh, it's, it's as important as as home ownership is and single family um, development is in this work we do know that in these neighborhoods I mean, our advice has been and our experience has been is that unless you make a big investment in something significant, an at scale housing investment, um, which is typically a multifamily mm -hmm. res rental uh, development, you're not getting the signal to the rest of the world that this neighborhood is heading in the right direction. So the multi challenge with, fa with single family homes is, as you know, it's such mm -hmm. a hard slog to go through a house by house. And Birmingham's been at it for you know, seven years now to get to 83. So it, it's got to be, a, we think, a combination of those two. So let me, let, we got we to line them. Questioners, please, go ahead. Uh, Dick Fleming from St. Louis. Uh, we are in the process of becoming a purpose-built community. And I want to respectfully push back on a couple of Rich's comments, having spent a, a very exciting day Thursday in St. Louis with he and his colleagues. And, and seeing your product, I, I tip my hat to you in terms of the quality. But I think back, uh, as a young Turk, I worked for Jim Ralph's mm -hmm. on the Columbia Newtown project. And Jim Ralph's was part capitalist and part socialist uh, at heart. And he wanted not only to have Columbia uh, uh, integrated from a racial standpoint, which it was from day one in the 1960s, but he wanted it to be income mixed. So he created Howard Homes and he provided townhouses for $16,000 back in 1968. And the people that bought them made a fortune. Mm -hmm. And Columbia never got integrated from an income standpoint. Mm -hmm. If Purpose Built has a next chapter, I would submit, it is applying the secret sauce that you've done on schools, and weighted waiting lists to assure the kind of balance that you've achieved that Carol referenced yesterday to the residential issue. If we don't, uh, I think we will have failed in a mission in terms of if, if all of the purpose-built neighborhoods become gentrified down the road, um, in our case, our challenge is to bring market rate housing into North St. Louis, which has been abandoned for years. But we'll consider it a failure if all that does is pushes out the low and moderate income housing. So I'd, I'd push back a little bit and urge public uh, purpose built to, to get the, the magic sauce for that. So well, I, I couldn't agree more. The, uh, you'd be interested to know that, so 22 years into the East Lake project, they're about to break ground, well, they hopefully will break ground next year on a third phase of mixed income housing. That's a community cornerback organization that's been around for 22 years, 
who are still focused on making sure that you have affordability in that neighborhood and, and keeping that floor high enough so that we're succeeding in this mission. It's just, A, you've got to plan for success. So again, going back to the lessons learned about buying land, I mean, again, we would love to be controlling a lot more land in Eastlake than we do today. And, and then being focused as a community quarterback organization, that, that in the long term is really your job, is to make sure that these healthy, gentrified neighborhoods, whatever term you want to use, have a wide channel of opportunity for access for low-income folks. Thanks, Dick. Timothy Ayers from Orlando. Um, I was going to ask this question at the last session, but I knew better to challenge a graduate from Spelman. <laughs> oh, great. I'm going to challenge uh, the three of you to respond to it. Um, gentrification, from my perspective, uh, makes no sense because two forces are making gentrification possible. One are the forces in terms of redlining and all that, but another is that the sons and daughters of the residents who live in a particular neighborhood, neighborhood have other options. And they may have decided to move out to neighborhoods that offer more amenities. So you have that going on in a number of places. Which leads me to my last question for uh, any one of you or all of you to answer. Um, so when we talk about whatever program, whatever construction we want to do, how do we design that so that we are stabilizing neighborhoods by whatever race and ethnicity, yet at the same time preserving the cultural heritage of that neighborhood. Well, I, th I think that was the one that opened that can of worms. I, 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 um, I certainly didn't mean to imply that, uh, that this was a recipe for purpose-built communities. I, I'm, I'm, I'm Suggesting that there, you know, that, that that there is a lot more around this country that is happening besides purpose-built communities. That 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 are people that are on the ground trying to community groups, community development groups that are trying to um, improve their neighborhoods, uh, and they confront this issue every day um, around you know how do we improve the neighborhood and not tip the balance. And so you know, I wasn't I was speaking generically about that. Um, you know, I, I think that you know you said something that was really important. You know, how do you how do you how do you uh, maintain the cultural element that is the richness of the neighborhood? Uh, I think that's what the community group does. You know, as a real estate developer, one of the one of the difficulties is that we're not a community group. We will never be a community group because we're not perceived as a community group. We're not of the community. Um, and so we have to have a community partner. We, we need to have someone that, that carries the, um, you know, the, 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 the belief that, that, that they represent the community. And so you, know, you, you have to have someone who really has the community's best interests, long-term interests at heart when they're thinking about these issues so that everybody buys into the vision, you know that that it's not the developer's vision, that it's not a particular one particular person's vision, that it is the community has bought into the idea of this is the way how we're going to go forward, and you know let's see how it turns out, but this is what the intention is, and so it's this you know the per, what what's great about purpose built is it's intentional, you know they know what they're trying to, to get, they know what what their end game is, it's intentional. Most community development is not as intentional. Mm. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's more focused. And so I'd say, you know, if you're intentional about how you approach it, if you're thoughtful about how you're going to try and preserve affordable housing, um, you can only move forward and try and make those improvements. And there are always going to be adjustments along the way. I mean, the, the additional thing that I would say is uh, I think intentionality is incredibly important to, uh, to just echo something that Rich just mentioned. But I, what I'm struggling with, and maybe this is why you should have asked Dr. Tatum this, this question, is uh, uh, what the right dosage needs to be of these kinds of conversations in our community, right? So for you to, to put a proposition around how does a, how does a place not lose culture, you know, I start thinking about, about deconstructing what that conversation needs to be over periods of time uh, in a place so that people can feel like they're exercising control, 
part of what I know has happened in so many of these places, gentrifying or otherwise, is the loss of control, the sense that something is underfoot and I am no longer a part of it, nor can I exercise agency or control in it. I think we need to, and Theaster Gates, part of what he has done in place making is to, is to have art and culture and place start uh, blending together so people feel like whatever happens, they are a part of a community and a part of a place. Yeah. I'm Darren Orr from Indianapolis, and um, I've got the awesome pleasure of living in the neighborhood adjacent to our purpose-built community. And, you know, it's one thing to operate in theory, and it's another to actually go through the process of trying to bring a neighborhood up from the inside. And when you're looking at gentrification, it seems like it happens because when you're talking about the single-family housing part of it, it seems like it happens because the only way that you can build a home in an area that has been underserved and undervalued is to finance that entire project yourself. Hmm. So you, we have a whole community of long-standing members. So it's not that we need to bring people in to move into the neighborhood. It's that we have folks that live in the neighborhood that, that desire to build but can't get financing to do it hmm. because the, the comps won't hmm. sustain or won't justify it. So the fact that we have a $70 million investment in our Avondale Meadows, and I look at East Lake and I see the development that's happened in the housing outside of East Lake. The question is, who do we lobby from a local, state, or federal government uh, perspective to, to lean on the banks mm. to finance the local residents that want to build in the neighborhood? Because as the needs change, the goal is not to have people be um, uh, low income always. We want them to get better jobs and make more money and stay in the neighborhood. But if the neighborhood doesn't facilitate that, then they move out. So how can we affect that? Hmm. Yeah, I, I once, uh, I was at a, at a um, meeting with a former treasury secretary, I happened to be with him, and I, I said, you know, there's this, all this discussion about tax reform and repatriating corporate dollars that are parked overseas. And, and um, wouldn't it be nice if, if there was a mechanism for allowing corporations to bring that, all those trillions of dollars back into the United States uh, in the same way that we did the Community Reinvestment mm -hmm. Act, that, the, that there was a requirement that a portion of those funds go into uh, improving uh, inner city neighborhoods. And the former Treasury Secretary um, said, uh, well, that's a ridiculous idea. That'll never happen. So, so there's, a, there's a great deal of thinking outside of the box and from government officials. I, I wouldn't put my hope there, but, <laughs> but I, I, I would say that- Keep hope uh, alive, Richard. keep <laughs> hope alive. You know, I would say that the, you know, you, what, the, the problems in these inner cities, and I don't have to throw anybody in here, are so, um, are so uh, intense that you, there's, there, you need a lot of money and you need to focus, you know, you need to really focus on a particular area. Um, but we need to find, you know, big sources of capital. You know, like the, the idea that I just suggested, the, the low-income housing tax credit was, mm -hmm. in 1987, it changed the game, yes. you know? And so there needs to be something like that that happens, that can be bought into from both sides. That was a, that was a Republican, Democrat combined program. You know, something has to happen like that where Democrats and Republicans come together and they come up with a new program that is focused on you know, urban revitalization. Uh, we're, we are almost out of time. We can take one more question, okay. and then I'm sure Rich and Solon can hang out and ask, ask, mm -hmm. answer any questions. If, uh, well, the gentleman in front of me actually went very much in the same place where I was um, going. Um, I am an affordable housing attorney that represents developers, but I also continue to live in a predominantly African-American community in Houston, Texas. My concern when I am going out with my developers to talk to neighborhoods um, is that too often, like what I heard you say, um, the developers take the position, it's hard, it's too hard to do home ownership, but home ownership is the end all be all answer to everything. I think somewhere we do have to get, um, really start getting outside of ourselves and outside the box and make certain that we're bringing the banks into the community, not just the government piece, but looking at the banks. 
um, Dr. Tatum said it, and the reality is it still exists. Redlining still exists. The um, regulations have not changed in a way that is able to change home ownership as a game changer for um, most minority communities. And I would challenge Purpose Built and all of us in this room that we have to look at ways to make certain that we are challenging our banks, that we are creating financing tools for ourselves when our communities, our cities are creating land banks, that we are making certain that those land banks are set up in a way that they are rolling those um, that land back into the community so that people can truly be homeowners by creating $1 um, land programs so that building or renovation on the homes that they don't own can eventually go into their hands. I simply challenge all of you. I hope that we continue the discussion so I have more of a challenge of thought as opposed to a question. Thank well, you. Well, that's actually a great way to, to end this. Thank you so much for that and uh, amen to all of that. Um, again, uh, first of all, let's give a hand to our panel. Thank you so much.